Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'll try to do what that is. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I decided, I think I said enough, even though there's a lot more to be said about paternal power last time. So I'm just going to start right in talking about the beginning of chapter seven. Um, and the beginning of chapter seven is uh, Locke's discussion of marriage. So, um, right, so uh, Hobbes basically doesn't discuss this at all. The relationship between the well, let's say the relationship between the parents of the same children is the main thing we're talking about. Of course, that's at least in a civil state, uh, that's, you know, doesn't exhaust the meaning of marriage, right? But, uh, or doesn't even, but I mean, I, anyway, I think that's, that's, that's mostly what we're talking about here. Uh, so, um, so Hobbes really doesn't say anything about it. Um, and in a sense, he couldn't say anything about it, at least not in a state of nature, because according to Hobbes, uh, um, there is no marriage in the state of nature. Um, and so like the way Hobbes, you know, because it uh, involves a compact of some kind, and compacts in the state of nature, according to Hobbes. Well, like, I mean, sometimes he says uh, you can make a compact, but then you're like not obliged to, to keep it. <laughs> and other times he says there are, are no compacts. And I guess those two are pretty much the, right. Like, why would you make it if the parties aren't obliged to keep it? Right. So, um, so, um, Although, I mean, Hobbes does say that, they, that, that who will get dominion of the children is going to be settled by a contract. I guess it's a contract that's not a contract, meaning that the, like the goods are delivered right away. <laughs> so the, I guess this, this, and so I guess we should think of this as happening at the time of birth. I'm not sure if that's consistent with what he says rather than the time, like, rather than before they got together as a couple that made this contract, like they maybe they had to make the contract when the children are actually born. I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, Hobbes, uh, no, I don't think that's consistent with his explanation, by the way. Well, leaving aside Hobbes, um, well, I guess I'll say one more thing about Hobbes. So, you know, so in Hobbes, the question is always about um, which parent is going to get dominion over the children. He doesn't have anything to say about one parent having dominion over the other. I mean, he doesn't, it appears that in the state of nature, he, he thinks that both parents probably won't stay around. Um, and in a civil state, I guess he thinks that's going to be regulated by civil law and it's not his business to go into the details. Um, whereas Locke starts off chapter seven um, by saying the first society was between man and wife. Um, So, uh, so what is this society between man and wife that Locke is talking about? So first of all, it involves, as I said, it involves some kind of compact. Um, now, um, it's not clear whether, uh, it's not clear to me whether Locke always uses compact in Hobbes' strict sense, right? Where a compact is a contract where the rights and the, 
are exchanged immediately, but the goods may be delivered later. Um, but, um, but in this case, um, well, so I guess it depends what you think the compact or contract is about. Um, so that like, um, there's two purposes of this, of this contract that the, the um, man and woman are making between each other. Now, so like, by the way, you know, um, Locke is well aware that monogamy is not the only way of doing things. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, if you're involved in biblical interpretation, you would have to be aware of it, really, because in the Bible, most of the important men have more than one wife. But Locke actually is one of his uh, arguments against Filmer says, uh, well, Filmer, what, what do you say will happen in those parts of the world where a woman has more than one husband? Right, so he's, so, so he's aware that there's a lot of different ways of possibly organizing this, but I think just for the sake of simplicity, he's focusing on a case where there's one man and one woman and they're making this contract with each other. And the primary purpose of the contract is um, procreation. That is, uh, and I mean, Locke doesn't get quite as graphic as Kant does about this, but you know, Kant infamously, infamously says that marriage is a, uh, contract for the use between the man and the woman for the use of one another's genitals. <laughs> um, Locke just says for the use of one another's body for the purpose of procreation, <laughs> right? Um, so like that's the primary purpose. Um, I think at least in a state of nature that uh, kind of makes sense. Um, I, I don't know that, especially in a civil state, I assume that Locke would agree that people who can't have children with each other can still get married, right? I mean, uh, like for example, if a woman is past the childbearing age or whatever, right? Um, so, uh, um, but, you know, like in a complicated civil society, there's all kinds of reasons for doing that. Um, presumably like in the state of nature, it's not like your health insurance is gonna depend on whether you're married to a partner. There, there is no health insurance. <laughs> I mean, I guess there is no, could there be health insurance? There could be money. I guess there could, in theory, according to Locke, be health insurance in the state of nature, but it, it probably wouldn't work very well. All right. Um, anyway, but so uh, so the point is, so I think like the, it, it makes sense to say it, in the state of nature that this is the reason they're forming this contract. Yeah. So is Locke's uh, idea of state of nature the exact same as Hobbes? Well, it's certainly not, right? I mean, I talked about a lot of differences between them before, right? Uh, and moreover, I also talked last time about the way within Hobbes and Locke, there's a tension between different things that state of nature could be, right? So, and I mean, actually that's that's going on here. That's, that's relevant in both Hobbes and Locke because one of the things that they're both thinking about is like when monarchs marry one another and then, you know, who's gonna to have dominion over the children. So the monarchs are in a state of nature with respect to each other. And the question is like, will the children, um, um, uh, because, you know, Queen Mary married uh, King of Spain <laughs> at some point, right? So this is like a live type of issue, right? Uh, so, um, um, 
And that's the state of nature in the sense that they're not both under a common civil power, but it's not the state of nature in the sense that they're running around in the woods collecting acorns, right? So, um, but, but to get your question about Hobbes versus Locke, yeah, they're, I mean, they're different, right? That's why I started off by saying in Hobbes' state of nature, you can't make, well, you can make an immediate contract if that's what this part is. I'm going to argue in a second that that seems to be what this part is, although it's not clear, right? But, um, but in Hobbes' state of nature, you can't make an ongoing contract. The, the, the goods are going to be delivered later, right? So, so that's because Hobbes' state of nature is different. Did, did, was there a more specific thing? Yeah, okay. So, but Locke says, you know, this is the primary purpose, but because of the way human beings are, um, he says that like this purpose can't be fulfilled unless, um, um, because human beings are born helpless, right? This purpose won't be fulfilled if they just have children and leave. Um, so, uh, so it's at least implicit in their agreement to use one another's bodies for procreation that they're also going to, um, care for the children. So this part is definitely a compact in the sense that the goods are going to be delivered later. Goods are going to be delivered over many years. Um, so, um, and 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 so, even though, like, this is so to speak, a secondary feature of their agreement, like. This is a really big deal. This, like, right? This just happens in one quick session. <laughs> this continues for years and years, and is like very difficult. Um, so, um, so, uh, so the secondary purpose actually ends up really you know, explaining most things about what this institution is going to be like and, and how the parties are related to each other. I, I mean, you know, I think one uh, one way to, to see how Locke understands this is his little, he has this little uh, sociobiology section here. <laughs> um, uh, chap it's in chapter seven, section 79. And um, it's not very accurate, <laughs> it's biology, right? Like, I mean, he says, basically he says, well, uh, um, in those viviparous animals which feed on grass, viviparous means bearing live young, not laying eggs, but he actually goes on to talk about birds too, so I don't know, anyway. In those viviparous animals which feed on grass, the conjunction between male and female lasts no longer than the very act of copulation. Because the teat of the dam being sufficient to nourish the young till it be able to feed on grass, the male only begets but concerns not himself for the female or young, to whose sustenance he can contribute nothing. Right? So, uh, like the viviparous animals, they're like, Locke is saying, well, there really isn't anything the father can do to take care of the children. I mean, the grass is just there. <laughs> so, um, uh, whereas he says in the case of beasts of prey, uh, where, you know, so uh, like the mother can't hunt as much, which is caring for the children, the, the father can go out and hunt, and therefore they're associated with each other longer. And like I said, this is not, I mean, you know, we compare horses or elephants to uh, like tigers or, you know, I mean, it, it, I don't think it really lines up. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, 
But the thing that's interesting about it is the implication for what Locke thinks about the human institution, which, as I said, seems to be that if it weren't for this secondary purpose, there would be no reason for any long term contract for the primary purpose. It's not even clear what the long term contract would be. Um, Uh, but in any case, he, he doesn't seem to think that there's any need for it. The need for a long-term relationship between the parents comes from the fact that the children have to be cared for. Um, so, um, So, I mean, so far, so good, but, you know, this doesn't involve any kind of dominion of one person over another, right? This is like an agreement to do something together. Um, so, uh, um, then Locke adds, however, that the purpose of this compact is such that it does necessarily involve a kind of dominion. And um, the way he explains it is, so this is paragraph uh, chapter seven, paragraph 80, section 82 um, on page 44. But the husband and wife, though they have but one common concern, yet having different understandings will unavoidably sometimes have different wills too. It therefore being necessary that the last determination, that is the rule should be placed somewhere, it naturally falls to the man's share as the abler and the stronger. So, I mean, this is kind of a weird explanation from many points of view. I mean, like, uh, I mean, uh, so, I mean, first of all, I assume he's talking about this secondary purpose here there exclusively, right? I mean, this doesn't <laughs> require, uh, uh, you know, that kind of negotiation of different wills. Uh, um, but this certainly does, right? Because, uh, um, you know, like, well, perhaps most, uh, well, this isn't the only type of situation it comes up, but it certainly comes up when the children say, I want to do X, and one parent says, that's okay, and the other one says, no. <laughs> right, so, um, uh, however, you know, um, it's not so clear really that, uh, that, I mean, so like suppose two people go into business together as partners, so they don't have to agree that one of them is gonna have the final say if they disagree, right? So what happens if they disagree? Well, they have to work it out. And until they work it out, they can't do it. Um, but, you know, and that could be inconvenient, but uh, it might, um, they might be willing to risk that disagreement rather than set up the partnership so that one of them always has the final say. So, so, so that's one way this explanation is kind of weird. Another way it's kind of weird is that um, is that um, the explanation is like not very convincing. Like, so uh, the man is abler and stronger. So uh, like, um, I mean, I 
I guess it's true that the man is stronger on average, although, as I've said before, that's definitely only on average. It's not like there aren't a lot of women who are smarter than me. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, okay, that's that. maybe that's true on average, but um, why is that the relevant factor? I mean, like, if we got to the point where they were like kind of arm wrestling each other for this, then they already are gonna be in trouble, right? I mean, they shouldn't be settling it that way. <laughs> so, um, so it seems like kind of a flimsy reason. So, I mean, um, I think uh, like, I think the reason this explanation is here, even though it's not that convincing, I mean, there's two reasons. First of all, Hobbes, I mean, Hobbes, Locke, I guess is trying to explain the institution that he finds in most places that he knows of, right? Like he's it's not everywhere he knows of, but in most places he knows of, it seems like the fathers are in charge of the family. So Hobbes, remember, just doesn't have a good explanation for that at all, right? Hobbes says in the state of nature, it would, I mean, it's not exactly the same question again, right? Because for Hobbes, the question is which parent is gonna, has exclusive dominion over the children and the other one's gonna go away. In Locke, the question is which of the two is gonna like have the final say in disagreements. Um, by, the, by the way, I mean, I assume he thinks that this is not a right that would be exercised that often. I don't know. I mean, I guess I assume that from personal experience at least that like, um, normally the last thing you want to do is like second guess the other parent <laughs> right i mean you want to say do what your mother said you know <laughs> right i mean so it's it's probably you know this he probably doesn't think that this right would be invoked very often but it, but in any case like he um but he does want to explain why there would be a presumption in that on that side um but i think more importantly as usual, the target, the official target is not Hobbes, but Filmer. And he wants to explain this in a way that supports, that lends no support to Filmer. That's, so I think that's the, like, um, um, so the, if I were to read the next, no, no, I see it's not. Um, section eighty three. Yeah, no, it is section 82. Yeah, I just wrote it down here wrong in my notes. On page 44, the next sentence after the one I just read about how the, you know, that one has to have the final say and it's naturally going to be the man. By naturally, I think he means like not according to the law of nature, but kind of like, you know, um, like that's kind of the course of least resistance or something like that, normally or something. But anyway, uh, but the next sentence says, but this reaching but to the things of their common interest and property leaves the wife in full and free possession of what by contract is her peculiar right and gives the husband no more power over her life than she has over his. Um, the power of the husband being so far from that of an absolute monarch that the wife has in many cases the liberty to separate for him. Right, so what he's saying is, like, he's trying to give this that this particular explanation um, rather than leave it unexplained why he finds fathers in charge of families, because he wants to make it clear that it's not for the reason Filmer would give, namely that God put the father in charge, <laughs> and the father is an absolute monarch to the family. No, these are two independent people who have entered a contract and for reasons particular to the contract, 
in certain types of decisions, one of them is going to have a final say, and locks is it's limited to that. So, like, if a husband starts trying to make rules, that is the father who's now being understood as a husband tries to starts to trying to make rules for another person just because they're both parents of the same children. Um, she's going to say, "What does that have to do with my?" Um, all right, so that's, um, that's all I want to say about that for now, I guess. I mean, it's not like, so the, first of all, the way I've explained it, it turns out that maybe the details of it, like, that, you know, Because I just I kind of gave an ex an ex uh, explanation of why Locke has an explanation of this institution which isn't that convincing, like just in terms of what he actually cares about. Um, so maybe that makes the details of it less interesting per se. Also, it's not like closely connected to anything else in his um, political philosophy, as far as I can see. Um, on the other hand, uh, Rousseau and then especially Wollstonecraft are going to spend a lot of attention on the nature of this institution, how it could have started, what it might be good for, et cetera. So that's why at least I thought it was, and like I said, Hobbes basically doesn't say anything about it. So that's why I thought it was worth going into some of the details of what Locke says about it. Um, are there questions about that? Yes. Yes, I mean, I understand what's like a, a compact or like a clean goods that would be delivered later, right? How, what's the, is there a distinction between a compact and a contract? Or? Well, a contract is a type of, uh, I'm sorry, a compact is a type of contract. This is the way Hobbes defines the terms. Like I said, I'm not sure that Locke necessarily follows this strictly with Hobbes' definition. I don't recall that Locke ever, you know, says that he's following it. Um, but yeah, so according to, to Hobbes, a contract is where we agree to exchange rights and goods. A special type of contract is a compact in which the rights are, are transferred now, but the goods will not be transferred till later. Yeah. Yes, yes, Hobbes uses covenant and compact. But I'm saying compact because compact is the word that Locke actually uses here. Um, yeah, I guess Hobbes more often calls it a covenant, but he says he uses the two interchangeably. Other questions? I feel like somehow last time I lectured on this, there were a ton of questions about this particular text, but, <laughs> but maybe I didn't present it in this. It's been a way this time. I don't know. Anyway, I, uh, it's just as well because I, there's a lot of other stuff to talk about here, and especially um, the nature of political society and how political society begins, <laughs> right? So that's, that's pretty important. Um, so, um, right, political society, again, since Paulus, and Civitas are equivalents. This is basically, the, this should be exactly the same thing as civil society. It's just Greek, Greek versus Latin. I mean, uh, uh, later on, starting, I guess, with Hegel, people start to make a distinction between political society and civil society. But I think Locke, uh, you know, would, considers those to be uh, synonyms. All right, so what is a political society? Um, um,
Okay, so here it is. It's, the definition is in section 87 on page 46. I guess it's a definition. Anyway, it's a description. There only is political society where every one of the members have quitted this natural power. So the natural power he's talking about here is the power to punish offenses against the um, law, offense, offenses against themselves or anyone else. Right. Remember, that's the that's the right that Locke says everyone has in the state of nature, not just to punish people for violating my rights, but to punish people for violating someone else's rights. So um, every one of the members have quitted this natural power, resigned it up into the hands of the community. Um, one of the members have quitted this natural power. I guess this is, okay. Resigned it up into the hands of the community in all cases that exclude him not from appealing for protection to the law established by it. Right, that, that, that last somewhat confusing qualification is saying that, so this is, this is what happens when we um, form a civil society. All of us have the right to um, punish offenses against anyone under the law of nature. So we agree that, however, that we're not gonna exercise that right. We're resigning it up to society, um, except in, this is a clearer way to put it, except in cases where we're not able to appeal to the society for protection. Right, so what he's thinking is like, if you're walking alone on the highway, and someone tries to rob you, you can punish them without waiting for the civil society because that will be too late. <laughs> um, so, but I was going to come back later. Maybe I'll leave it there. All right. Anyway, oh, so, uh, um, but I mean, So that's actually a, a potentially important qualification, but, but the main point is that everyone who has resigned up into the hands of the community, their natural power to punish. Um, so this, I mean, this sounds pretty similar to Hobbes. Right. Remember, like, um, according to Hobbes, when I for, when we form the Commonwealth, we so okay. So according to Hobbes, we don't have a power to we don't have a right to punish in the state of nature, not because there's like a way of punishing people, but we're not allowed to do it, but because there's no such thing as punishing people in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, right? Because punishment, by definition, requires a law. And there is no law in the state of nature, according to Hobbes. So according to Hobbes, what I have in the state of nature is a right to defend myself by whatever means seem fit to me. Um, so, uh, um, um, but that's pretty much the equivalent of Locke's right to punish people. I mean, it's, uh, um, Anyway, it's 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 the it's the right I have to do harm to other people because uh, it seems like the right thing to me to do. Put it that way. So you know, so according to Hobbes, there's pretty much low, no limitation on what should seem like the right way <laughs> to me. But according to Locke, you know, uh, it's uh, um, has to be as punishment for violating the law of nature. Um, but one way or another, we agree that to form a commonwealth, we agree that we're all like giving this right to one person, not necessarily one individual, right? But one legal person, the community. 
So, um, but there's actually an important difference here. Um, and um, um, the difference is because, so according to Hobbes, I only have rights in the state of nature. I have all rights. <laughs> so um, I can lay down whichever ones I want. Well, of course, uh, Hobbes says I can't lay down the right to defend myself against uh, attempts on my life. Right? Remember, he says I can't lay that down, meaning I literally can't lay that down. Because whatever I say about, like, you can come kill me and I won't resist you whatever reasons I have for keeping my promise are not gonna be as strong as the reasons I have for resisting you when you come to kill me. So there, there isn't gonna be an artificial chain, on it, right? So that's, that's why Hobbes says that, you know, that there, there's, there's certain rights that I can't lay down, but like, that's the only limitation. Basically. Other than that, I just have all these rights. I have as many rights as I could want. And the question is which ones are gonna lay down? But according to Locke, to Locke, I no longer, I not only have rights in the state of nature, but I also have obligations. There are limits to my rights, which means that there's certain things that I'm not at liberty to do or forbear. Either I must do them or I must forbear doing them. Right? So, um, So like, remember, you know, not only do I have both of those things, but according to Locke, I have one of them because of the other, right? Like he says, I, you know, I only have the right to act freely within my own sphere of protected liberty because um, I uh, acknowledge the obligation not to interfere with other people. Um, so that means though that this right that I have, I can't really lay it down absolutely because um, you can give away a right, but you can't give away an obligation. Right, so like I can trust someone else to fulfill my obligation, but if they fail, the obligation is gonna come back on me. So, um, you know, like, like if I, if I make an agent just ordinary, you know, like I make an agent, I tell someone go buy these potatoes for me, right? And then they go and steal the potato <laughs> and bring them back to me. Um, I can't say I gave my obligation not to steal up to the eighth. <laughs> right? So um, thanks, now they're my potatoes. <laughs> I, I can't give that obligation up. It's still there. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, in particular, according to Locke, it would, you know, the obligation would therefore include like giving the potatoes back to the person they were stolen from. Um, and and, uh, and uh, probably also, so it's not clear, like Locke talks about the right to punish people in the state of nature. It's, it, it seems like it certainly goes a little bit farther than that, right? I mean, it's not just up to you whether to punish people. Like if someone is causing a lot of injustice, presumably you have some kind of obligation to punish them. He doesn't really say that. Um, it, you know, I mean, it's a tricky kind of obligation because um, I guess it's what you might call an imperfect duty. What is technically called an imperfect duty. Um, I don't know that, that Locke talks about this anywhere. Kant makes a big deal about it. 
right? Like a perfect duty is something that tells you exactly what to do or not to do, right? So like, don't murder. <laughs> the only way to fulfill that duty is not to murder. <laughs> but an imperfect duty is something that tells you that like, it's like morally meritorious to do something. You ought to do some of it, but it doesn't say exactly how much, right? So like Kant says this about the duty of beneficence of like doing good things for other people, right? Like you have a duty to do it, but how much? Um, um, well, you know, like where it stops is going to be determined by other considerations, like perhaps, you know, balancing out different claims on your, yourself or something like that, right? Because it's, you know, because, because in principle, there's no end to how much good you could try to do to other people. But the duty is not to do all of it, according to Kant, anyway. So, I mean, I think probably, you know, Locke is, first of all, probably thinks something similar about duties of beneficence. Although again, he doesn't talk about them very much, but like, I mean, you know, like going back to the parents example, like suppose the parents abandon the baby. So now I, there is some, right? Like everyone has a duty to preserve the human race. So according to Locke, um, so like now I guess there's kind of a duty somewhere to adopt the children, but it's not clear that, that any particular individual has to do it, right? I, you know, so like, I think it's similar with punishment in the state of nature, according to Locke that like, you know, like how close does the injustice have to be to me? And how much do I have to know about it? Or how hard do I have to try to find out before I'm required to punish it? You know, I don't know. But anyway, um, but I mean, one thing for sure, you're, you're definitely required to bring, give back the potato, <laughs> right? And, you know, you, you can't say, again, you can't say like, um, well, uh, um, I don't have that obligation anymore because I gave it up to my agent. So, um, so similarly in forming a commonwealth, right? So like, if I say I'm giving up my right to punish under the law of nature to this agent, um, and then they start, they, go out and use the power I've given them to start punishing unjustly or, or just otherwise randomly harming people unjustly. So I can't say, uh, you know, I gave up my obligation not to commit injustice to this agent. It's still there. So, um, so like, uh, Locke is, I mean, so again, like this problem doesn't come up for Hobbes. According to Hobbes, um, like in the state of nature, I had the right to harm anyone, as, you know, exactly as I saw fit. So I could give that, resign that right up to the sovereign. And now the sovereign has the right to do that. But according to Locke, I didn't have the right to do that. I had obligations to limit, um, you know, to, to keep my rights within certain limits and my rights only derived from keeping those obligations. So like, I can't give the sovereign unlimited right to harm because I don't have it. So if the sovereign starts doing that, then, you know, I'm going to like at a minimum have some duty to try to redress the wrongs and presumably at least some duty to try to punish the sovereign if I can. Yeah, did you have a question? No, are you keeping Now, I mean, this doesn't mean, and we'll see, you know, uh, in the more in the next reading where Locke talks in more detail about this. This doesn't mean that Locke thinks that every time you disagree with 
something that the government of the Commonwealth does, you are required to rebel and try to punish them. Um, it's, uh, you know, you have to, you have to weigh the costs and benefits, basically, is the way we talked about it, right? So, like, um, and in fact, most of the time, starting a rebellion is going to cause so much trouble, so much harm to so many people that it's not going to be worth it. Um, but uh, there always is going to be something that the Commonwealth could do, I think, that would impose an obligation on, the, on its subjects to rebel, according to law. So like, it's not just going to be that Hobbes says you can never legitimately rebel against your sovereign. And Locke says, well, sometimes you can if you want. Hobbes is going to say you can never legitimately re rebel against your sovereign. And Locke is going to say, sometimes you must. Um, so, uh, so, so that's one way in which the way we're laying down rights according to Locke, even though it seems similar to Hobbes, there's, Hobbes, there's a really important difference. Um, um, the second difference is a little bit harder to understand, but perhaps even more important. Um, which is so like, I can't, abs I can't absolutely resign my rights under the law of nature, according to law. Right, I, that, I always, that, that was the first difference, right? I always keep in reserve because, I, because I'm required to. I would keep in reserve the right to say, oh no, no, agent, you're violating the law of nature. I have to put a stop to this, right? But the second thing is not about what I can't do, but it's about what I shouldn't do. Um, um, so, um, and what I shouldn't do, maybe I should write these two differences up there. These are differences between Locke and Hobbes. Right, so the first difference I was saying is Locke says, I can't absolutely resign my rights. I'm always resigning them on a condition. It's, it's, it, that's the op opposite of absolutely here. I, I'm always resigning them on the condition that the body I resign them to um, continues to fulfill my obligations. Um, but the second thing is that I shouldn't resign them to a private will. Um, I guess I should say I shouldn't resign them to another private will. That is, um, I shouldn't just uh, say, uh, um, okay, I resign all my rights to you. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, because Locke says, um, I mean, so again, Locke doesn't say that we can't do that. In fact, he, I didn't assign the part of the chapter where he tries to reconstruct the early history of political society based on like guesswork. And, myths and stuff and a little bit of actual history. Um, 
but uh, but you know, basically, he says, yeah, probably what happened at the beginning is people said, oh yeah, it would be a good idea if we like all resigned the right to punish to one central authority. And so there was like someone that they all trusted. And they said, okay, you do it. <laughs> right? And you know, maybe sometimes it was a father or mother uh, of a family. And maybe sometimes it was just someone that they knew that they all trusted. And, you know, like if a society was small enough and people all knew each other and that person really was trustworthy, maybe that worked pretty well. But Locke thinks it's not a good idea at all. And that as society gets bigger and we, you know, the person we trusted gets succeeded by someone else and so forth, we'll start to realize how bad an idea it is. Um, he says, you know, uh, because it won't solve the problem that makes us want to leave the state of nature, right? The problem that made us want to leave the state of nature. Well, I mean, hope to talk about that in some detail uh, at the end of the lecture, if I have time, like exactly what Locke thinks, why Locke thinks we want to leave the state of nature. But basically the reason we want to leave the state of nature is that all the punishment is being done by private individuals you know, based on their own private judgment in their own, pri in their own cases. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's not going to solve that problem and it might very well make things much worse. Like for example, if we, um, um, if we all decide to, to trust the same individual, the same private individual to do this, then that individual remains in the state of nature as Hobbes agrees. Um, so, um, so they're just as dangerous as someone in the state of nature, but they're more dangerous, right? Because now they have command of an army. <laughs> And moreover, Locke says they're going to be surrounded by flatterers who, who give them reasons why they're allowed to do whatever they want to. So presumably he's thinking of Filmer and Hobbes when he says that, and I guess maybe also of Machiavelli, right? They're going to be surrounded by these flattering political philosophers who will come up with complicated reasons why, no, actually, uh, there's no limits on your power. Um, so, um, so it's like living with someone in the state of nature, only you've made them super powerful and filled their heads with um, like delusions of grandeur. So he says like, that's much worse, right? Like he says, what, what would be worse being exposed to, you know, the arbitrary will of one person who has command of a hundred thousand or being exposed to the, arbitrary wills of 100,000 individuals. He says the first one is obviously much worse. <laughs> um, so, um, so we shouldn't do that, he says. It's a bad idea. And he also quotes Hooker to the, the same effect that how people at first thought maybe they should do this, but then they realized it's a bad idea. So, um, but the question is like, okay, what alternative is there? Um, so, I mean, because I think uh, Hobbes, will, Hobbes says there is no alternative. I mean, how can a will not be someone's private will? It's either the will of some private individual human being or it's the private will of some assembly. But like, even if the assembly, even if we have a pure democracy in Hobbes's sense, and the assembly is the assembly of the whole people, um, from my point of view, that assembly is a different person for me that has different interests than me. Right, and it's gonna, and it's gonna rule by majority. So it's going to, you know, um, reach conclusions based on its interests. And they're not going to be the same as my interests. So it's just like, um, 
it's really just like having a monarch in this respect. That's what, and that's what Hobbes keeps saying that, you know, that people who think that for some reason in a democracy, they're not exposed to absolute power are not thinking clearly. Because in the democracy also, there's absolute power. It's just, it's in this assembly. But the assembly's not you, <laughs> even if you're a member of it. It's another individual. It's a different person. Right, so, and um, Hobbes says, and so what else can you do? Someone has to decide. And whoever decides is by definition gonna be a private person with their, in this sense of private, right? I mean, of course it's not, uh, it's public because it's, it's, it's the government, right? But it's private in the sense that it's its own distinct interest different from mine. Uh, somehow somewhat, so, an entity like that is gonna to have to make the decision. So the answer to this, um, in Locke, and then um, like Rousseau, we're gonna see is gonna develop this more. And then Kant and Hegel develop it even further or like apply it to other issues. The answer is that the difference between a private will, um, so this is what we don't want in a public will or general will is not like who this, it's not a difference in the subject of the will, like of who has the will. It's a difference in the object of the will, like what it's allowed to will. <laughs> um, So this is Locke's explanation. Again, this is still in sec, uh, chapter seven, section 87 on page 46. And thus all private judgment of every particular member being excluded, the community comes to be umpire by settled standing rules, indifferent and the same to all parties. Right? A public or general will is a will that can only will general laws. Um, so it's like, it's, it's not a question of, I mean, not that Locke doesn't have ideas about what the best way to do this, but it's not a question of who is gonna be the representative. It's a question of what kind of, um, determinations the representative is going to be allowed to make. Um, and so, like, of course, Hobbes agrees. Well, remember, I pointed out that it's not that, first of all, Hobbes doesn't think that laws have to be given by the sovereign to everyone in the society. He talks about laws the sovereign gives to one individual. But I mean, and he doesn't, but he does agree that laws have to be standing, right? They have to be like promulgated and announced to the people they apply to. And, uh, and uh, the possible penalties like announced. Um, so, but for Hobbes, that's just part of the definition of law, right? Like, does the sovereign have a right to make a law without announcing it in advance on the spot for a particular individual? No, because that's not a law. But does the sovereign have a right to, to give a command on the spot without announcing it in advance to a particular individual and harm them if they don't follow it? Yes, <laughs> according to Hobbes. Right, so in other words, the sovereign can only make laws that are, that are like in some sense at least general rules or standing rules but the sovereign can also rule by decree. Um, whereas um, the closest thing to the sovereign in Locke, which is this representative that we're resigning our power up to, is only able to make standing rules indifferent and the same to all parties. So it can say, you know, um, um, 
everyone has to pay a tax, but it can't say, well, maybe that's not a good example. But it can say like, um, no one's allowed to go fishing in this stream, but it can't say Abe's not allowed to go fishing in this stream. Yeah. I just had a question that kind of like off topic, but like uh, for like martial law, would that be like where your normal rights are, are gone and, and uh, the sovereign has the right to impose its will to do whatever you want? Um, so, I mean, Locke does talk about the need in armies for to give absolute power to the commanding officers. Yeah, although he, he actually um, uses that as an example to show, like, even in that situation, what the limits are, right? So he says that, like, the general may have the right to um, punish you with death for disobeying an order, but the general doesn't have the right to uh, take your property, like your, like your estate. Um, the general like doesn't have the right to take your salary. <laughs> um, so it's yeah, so it's a for it's only for a very specific purpose in a very specific context. I don't think that, um, well, I mean, we'll see actually. So, uh, so uh, Locke does talk about cases where the executive, which I mean, I haven't even explained the difference in the legislative and the executive yet. Locke does talk about cases where the executive takes on special powers that haven't been given specifically by the community. Um, and I mean, I, like basically his explanation for what's going on there is that it's the law of nature that's taking over, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, but anyway, yeah, we'll see that later. So, but uh, yeah, so I mean, here we're talking about like, we're assuming the society is intact. <laughs> um, um, and there's no emergency. And, you know, so like, by the way, you might ask, well, so what if this, what if the executive says there's an emergency in there, if who's going to decide? And I mean, that's the type of question that Hobbes always asks. And Locke's answer is always, well, um, since there's no judge above them on earth in this matter, they, they, they must appeal to heaven which appeal to heaven means they have to fight, <laughs> right? Um, so meaning that, yeah, if the worst happens and the executive, you know, goes on a rampage, starts declaring martial law and whatever, yeah, the only recourse you're gonna have is to violence. Um, so, but, 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 you know, the thing is like Locke doesn't agree that that's always worse than the alternative. Or, like Hobbes thinks that's always going to be worse, no matter what. But Locke thinks it's not going to be worse than having my agent committing injustice or you know whatever. So anyway, but so but getting back to to this situation. So like assuming that there's no extraordinary powers being exerted here. So um, um, um. And so this explains why uh, Locke says that the supreme power in the Commonwealth is the legislative power. Should I really read this entire way up here? The supreme power in the Commonwealth is the legislative power. That is, it's a power that can only make law. Now, I mean, of course, like the laws are going to make distinctions between different kinds of people, but they have to do it in general terms. Right? So, like, obviously, you know, so they could be a law saying, well, I mean, first of all, law, most societies that Locke is familiar with have really big differences in legal status between different people, like nobles and commoners or whatever, right? So, um, uh, but, you know, um, 
for that to be that that can be done under this system, but it has to be done in general terms, right? So it can't say the law can't see, say like the following three people are no, and they're going to have this special status. It has to give like general qualifications or something like that. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, that's kind of an extreme case, but like in my other cases, you know, are, are necessarily come up all the time, right? So like, if you have a law saying that professional fishermen are allowed to catch this many fish, but amateur fishermen are allowed to catch this many fish or something like that, right? So, I mean, that's okay because amateur fishermen and professional fishermen are like general types of people that, you know, that anyone could qualify for in principle. It's the problem is, you know, the problem only comes up if it says, you know, everyone's allowed to cast this many fish, but Abe's not. <laughs> so they can't, that's not a law. They can't do that. Um, now, you know, can they, can they like sneakily get around and in effect actually do that? Yes, they can, but they shouldn't, right? I mean, you know, so, Again, you know, like, um, I think Locke agrees with Hobbes and it's just common sense, I don't know, but, but there's no way to do this that doesn't involve some risks. Once you give this power to people, the things are gonna go wrong. The question is just like, what's the safest way to set it up or something like that, right? So, Anyway, so, so, so this is the way to set it up. You resign this power to the legislative of the community, but only as a legislator. Now, I mean, that automatically not only makes the legislative supreme, but also explains why the legislative and executive powers are different. Because the, so the executive power is the power that's gonna enforce the laws with penalties and rewards, I guess, but it's mostly penalties, right? So the um, executive power is the power that's gonna enforce the law with, I mean, I guess, well, never mind. it's mostly penalties. So, and of course that has to happen in individual cases, right? It's like, um, if I'm the one who went out and caught too many fish, then someone has to like find me um, and that's the executive. So the executive is making a completely different kind of decision than the legislative. Um, so, um, Locke says that the executive is an agent of the legislative power. It's a weird kind of agent. It's an agent to do something they can't do themselves, <laughs> right? Like they're not allowed to decide individual cases. But, um, um, but they give general rules and someone acts on their behalf to apply them to individual cases. Um, so, um, And so, I mean, Locke, of course, is thinking of this as the parliament. I guess specifically as the House of Commons, and this is the king. So he's saying that the king is the agent of the parliament acting on its behalf to enforce the laws that it's made. This is obviously a very different conception of the relationship between the king and the parliament than the one we found in Hobbes. Um, and it's, uh, um, um, 
And it's different from the relationship between legislative and executive in the US Constitution also. Right, the US Constitution. So, I mean, first of all, like we had to find a way to do this without having a king, which was complicated and controversial. <laughs> But second of all, like these things have been set up as co-equal branches. One of them is not supposed to be supreme over the other. And there's also the judicial branch. I think I, I think uh, Locke, I think, believes that the judicature is part of the executive. He doesn't make that distinction. Right? It's to, to judge and impose penalties. Um, but you know. So, but, uh, but in uh, Britain, uh, the doctrine that the legislative is supreme did end up in, right? So there, like, there, there is no independent executive under that. I mean, there's like, first the, the legal executive, the queen doesn't really do anything. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the queen appoints a minister the prime minister who's going to do stuff. So the prime minister is the, you know, is the actual face of the executive. However, because of this, the parliament has the right to vote the part, the prime minister that the queen has appointed out of office because of the supremacy of the legislature. So um, the queen can only appoint a prime minister who uh, um, is supported by a majority in parliament. So in, so in effect, like parliament is running the, the show. Um, right, so um, um, now like the way I just talked about that though, I think brings up a, a problem that Rousseau is really gonna puzzle over that doesn't seem, that Locke doesn't seem to notice. And I think perhaps Locke doesn't notice it because as, as I said, this is a matter of like what you shouldn't do. Um, it's not that you can't have the same person exercise both of powers. So that is, it's not like, it's not that you can't make a private will, like resign, we can't all resign up our rights to a private will. It's just not a good idea. Um, so, and because of that, I think he doesn't, he doesn't think that these things have to be completely separated from each other. Like there can be exceptions or whatever. And what I'm getting at is who appoints the executive? How does that happen? So the executive has to be some in individual person or assembly. Um, who's gonna decide who they are? So Locke says, well, like, um, well, what does Locke say? He, I mean, he says that, that we actually set up the legislative and the executive at the same time. Um, maybe I'm saying this, I can't explain this in a kind of backwards way. I should put it this way. Rousseau is going to conclude that the legislative and executive power can't possibly be powers of the same person. Um, and that only the public or general will can make laws and only an authorized private will appointed as an agent for the public can execute the law. And so the problem from that point of view is how does anyone ever get appointed as the private will that's gonna execute the laws? Yeah. So, I mean, if uh, the executive is like the agent of the legislative, the point of the legislative is 
our will to this like general public will. But I mean, from, I guess from my understanding, what it means to act as like an agent, in what sense have, have we not designed our will to this, this executive, this agent? And I mean, are, are they, it's like Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau operating on different understandings of what it means to be an agent. Well, I think, no, I mean, so this agent is, I mean, remember, Hobbes himself agrees that in general, an agent can be, a made, be an agent under conditions and for specific purposes. Right. It's only in the case of, and even the sovereign, according to Hobbes, there are such conditions, only like there's no way of enforcing them, right? But, um, but you know, so this is the agent of the legislative, but only for enforcing the laws that are made by the legislative. Anything else, with the exception of these possible like prerogatives and emergency powers that he's going to discuss. But anything in general, anything else the executive does is their own private action, right? They're only authorized on behalf of the public to enforce the laws that are made by the legislature. So it's, yeah, it, we haven't really resigned our rights up to the executive. Um, um, but there still is a problem, like I said, of like who is authorized by the executive. And if it's, you know, the legislative, the legislative acting as representative of all of us, you know, that is all the authority of the legislative comes from our having resigned certain rights up to it. Um, and it's authorizing this executive. That seems like that has to be, this is a private object. So this is an act of a private will, not a public will. Um, So, um, so like I said, I think, you know, Locke doesn't see this as a problem because, or anyway, he doesn't see it as a big problem or it doesn't jump out at him such that he has to address it because he, he's just, you know, well, like obviously except for this, they have to appoint the executive, right? You know, and that, that, that solves the problem. Whereas, whereas for Rousseau, it's going to turn out that, that, you know, no, it's absolutely impossible for the legislative power to do this. And he's going to have to give a definite explanation of how it works. Um, um, so, um, so, I mean, the executive does gain a kind of dominion over us because of this. Um, that is, you know, because what we like, so the right we gave up was um, the right to punish. So the right to employ force for the execution of judgment. So, um, it's just that uh, we gave it up in such a way that it can only be directed by general rules. So we, you know, so, so we said, like, <coughs> someone is going to have all of our power to punish that we had in the state of nature, but they're only going to be able to do it according to general rules. Yeah, did you have a question? No? Okay. So, um, um, but this is the way Locke puts it. This is in section 88 on page 47. Um, He has thereby quitted his power to punish offenses against the law of nature in prosecution of his own private judgment. Yet with the judgment of offenses which he has given up to the legislative in all cases, sorry, sorry. 
I suddenly don't understand the syntax of this sentence. Now, let me just start here. He has given a right to the Commonwealth to employ his force for the execution of the judgments of the Commonwealth whenever he shall be called to it, which indeed are his own judgments, they being made by himself or his representative. Right, so once the executive comes to me and says, I'm hereby punishing you, uh, you know, under the law, um, uh, or, well, you know, again, so that, so that I think this is true in Locke and Hobbes, the really important situation is once the executive comes to person X and says, I'm hereby punishing you according to the law, I've given up my right to reach my own private judgment about whether X should be punished or not. Um, I, you know, so um, um, I've given up the right to interfere with this and I've also promised to assist if necessary. But of course, not absolutely, <laughs> right? Again, like, if it turns out that the legislative and or the executive are violating the law of nature, then um, um, I'm not gonna be able to say, well, that's their problem. Um, so, uh, so like, I guess to say with, within the law, as long as the executive is within the law, the civil law and the legislative and the executive are within the law of nature, um, I have given them a certain right to command me that is dominion. Um, okay, so so this is basically like this is basically what a political society is, according to law. Are there questions about this before I go on to something else? I'm going to talk about how political societies start. And, I'm doing pretty well, actually. The other two things I want to talk about is how the political society starts, which is relatively simple, actually. And then the other thing I want to talk about is territory how political societies end up being, how commonwealths end up being places rather than just contracts. That actually is very hard to understand or confusing. Um, but before I go on to those things, are there questions about this? Okay, so, um, so the, yeah, so the, like I said, the first thing I wanted to talk about is how political society begins according to law. Um, so it's, um, it's relatively straightforward. If anything, it's actually easier to understand this than, than it is in Hobbes, because remember, like according to Locke, in the state of nature, we're already able to make compacts with each other. Um, so, uh, um, so we can make this special kind of compact with each other if we want. Um, but, you know, how we do that exactly. Um, there's uh, just as in Hobbes, I think there's two separate stages of it. The first, um, the first step is the is the decision to become a community. This is chapter eight, section, no, chapter eight, no, chapter seven, section, this chapter, chapter eight, section 99. This is done by barely agreeing to unite into one political society, which is all the compact that is or needs be between the individuals that enter into or make up a commonwealth. So, um, 
decision to become a commonwealth. This step has to be unanimous. Just as Hobbes said, at least uh, as Hobbes said in a state in a case of Commonwealth by institution, um, everyone who's going to be part of the Commonwealth has to agree. Um, if they don't agree, they're not part of the Commonwealth. But the Commonwealth is just the compact they're making between them, right? So, um, but uh, but this is all they have to agree to. They, they get together and they all agree. Um, we're gonna make, we're gonna surrender up our right to punish blah, 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 somehow or other <laughs> to the community. Um, but then the second step is, um, that they have to decision on form of government. So this is unanimous. And the form of government. And Locke says, that having made this decision, they've already tacitly agreed that this decision is going to be made by majority. Or maybe not tacitly, maybe it's part of, maybe they actually say it, I don't know. But <laughs> um, anyway, um, um, so, so they do two things. They get together in a state of nature and they agree to become a commonwealth. And then they vote on what kind of commonwealth they're gonna be. And I guess also at that time, they choose who is gonna be, like who will be the first holders of certain offices that they're setting up. Um, There's some unclarity about what if later on the majority of people decide this was a mistake? When can they reassert themselves and say, no, we want a different one? Um, so like, remember, according to Hobbes, the answer is no. <laughs> because according to Hobbes, after they make this decision, the sovereign that they've chosen, and in Hobbes, this step is choosing the sovereign, right? And after they make this decision, the sovereign they've chosen has the right to vote for everyone. So the, the sovereign is always going to win all the votes going forward. <laughs> um, but, uh, but according to Locke, it may not be that simple. So, I mean, we'll see a little bit of things he says about that next time, but it's, you know, it's, it's not completely clear, like under what conditions this, this like majority vote could be repeated. Um, but so, uh, like I said, that's pretty straightforward. And since well, I'm out of time anyway, I don't even have time to talk about territory. Um, well, I, you know, it's so important. I guess I am going to have to talk about it next time, at least a little bit. But I'll just say that, you know, like, there's a lot of things that are confusing about it. It's, I mean, it has something to do with the fact that the people who make the compact with each other that forms the Commonwealth, um, Locke is assuming that they have some land when they come in. And then he has an explanation, but this is not so clear why the Commonwealth gets a certain jurisdiction over all that land. 
it, it doesn't just become property of the community. Um, um, it still can't be taxed without representation. So, so territory is not the same thing as property, but somehow it does become part of the, well, I mean, so it becomes important because Locke says that um, you can be understood as giving tacit consent to the government of a certain territory just by existing freely in that territory, right? That was why I was gonna draw the highway again. That he says, just by passing freely down the public highway, you give tacit, tacit consent to the government as long as you're there. So even if like you're from France, but you're in England, you're walking along the highway, you've tacitly agreed to like abide by the law of England. Um, but the question is like, what magically gave this drown that power? <laughs> like if, you know, I mean, if you use an, if you're in France and an English person lends you their pencil, you don't become subject to the law of England while you're using the pencil. But so, but so there's actually, I mean, there's two puzzles here. First of all, was this public highway at some time someone's private property when the Commonwealth was formed? And how did it become a public highway? <laughs> and second of all, supposing it, it did somehow come in as someone's property when the Commonwealth was formed, um, why is real property have this power to like cause tacit consent where it's movable property doesn't? So, like I said, I wanted to talk about that some next time, but I don't know if I'll have time. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll see you all then.